and the book of the Psalms in chapter 133. Ephesians chapter 4, the book of the Psalms chapter 133. It will be a few minutes before we get to... Well, we'll just go ahead and... Whatever you just turned off was a blessing, Brother Michael. Thank you. I don't know what you just turned off, but something just cut off in these monitors, and that was a blessing. Thank you. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those of you who couldn't hear that, there's a friend of Miss Sheila's. She's come to church here a couple of times with us. And she just lost her husband not long ago. And she was watching and listening by way of live stream and getting a blessing. So thank the Lord for that. Um, let's go ahead and read Psalm 133. And then we'll go to Ephesians chapter number 4. We'll go ahead and get all these passages together. But, but put your little bookmark there in Psalm 133. Because we're not, we're not done here. This will be where we end our message at tonight. And we'll go ahead and just start the message here. And then we'll run to Ephesians chapter 4. Psalm 133. Verse number one, there is a word in three texts tonight that I want to lift out and highlight. This is the only three places in the Bible that this word is used. Um, Psalm 133, verse number one, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in, here's our word tonight, unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says in verse number 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep, here's our word, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace come down to verse number 13 this is the last place you find this word used in your bible verse 13 says till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ uh, I like what Paul says in verse number 3 of chapter 4. Notice the first word of verse number 3, endeavoring. The word endeavor or endeavoring literally means this. It means to exert one's self. I mean to really put some effort into something. It means to give diligence unto. Something you're really going to have to try hard at if you want to accomplish. And I say tonight, there is no harder endeavor as a church body and as a church family, there is no harder exertion of your spirituality or even your physical walk. There will be no greater endeavor in our church or any other church than to have unity amongst the membership. And so tonight I'm preaching on this subject to your heart for a few minutes. I've had this in my mind now for a while. And I'm preaching on this subject, unity, the church's greatest endeavor. Unity is the church's greatest endeavor. Now, now I want to say this at the onset of this message. This message tonight, this is the kind of message that um, while it's being preached, everybody in here is going to say amen to while it's being preached, everybody's going to nod their head and say, that's right, and I believe that, and that's the truth, and, and that's the Bible, and amen, preacher, yes, sir. This is the kind of message that everyone agrees with and says amen to until something happens that you don't like. This is the kind of message that everybody's all about, and the, the concept is... Uh, you know, is a wonderful concept, but it goes out the window as soon as something happens in the church that rubs you the wrong way. This idea, oh, I believe in unity, and I believe we need to keep unity about missionary. Oh, I believe in it. 
until something, somebody says something, somebody does something. And I'm not talking about something moral. We'll talk about the immorality and how unity has been perverted in a little bit. But until something doesn't happen just like you want it to, somebody says something to you or does something to you or says something to your child or says something to your family, and then all of a sudden it's unity be gone. My pride is more important than the unity of the whole church. Now I say amen right there because that's the truth. Now I want you to understand something. What I'm preaching about tonight, this is not a new concept. This is not a new struggle in the church. This has been a struggle of the church since the infancy of the church. Hence, the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. I taught through the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians here uh, in the last several years. It took us a long time to get through both of them. But you know the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The Corinthian church is not just a carnal church. They're a divided church. They're not unified. They're constantly fussing. They're constantly fighting. They're constantly bickering. You know, there's one guy over here that says, well, I, 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 I am of Apollos. I was saved under the preaching of Apollos. Then another guy says, well, well, I'm better than you. I was saved underneath the preaching of Cephas, the apostle Peter, who walk with the Lord. Then the other one, this is all in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Then another one says, no, no, I, I am of Christ. I, I go all the way back to walking with Jesus. I was there when he, you know, fed the 5,000, man. I, and then somebody said, well, I'm better than all y'all because I'm of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, the one that saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And there's a constantly infighting, fussing. Then they fuss and fight over who's got the best gifts. Somebody says, well, I talk in tongues. Another one says, well, I'm able to touch people and help them. Another one says, well, I preach. Another one says, well, I teach. Another one says, well, I sing. And they're fussing and fighting over who's got the best gifts and all this kind of stuff. And none of them's got charity one toward the other. And, and isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that the Corinthian church, they, 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 they trivialized that which was important. And, and, and then what was important, they trivialized. What wasn't important, they made a big deal out of. And what wasn't important, they didn't make a big, they, they made a big mountain out of a molehill. In other words, it's like this. The things that really mattered, the fella in the church, 1 Corinthians 5, who was fornicating, they wouldn't deal with that. They didn't think that was a big deal. But they thought it was a real big deal to tell everybody who they got saved under. They thought it was a real big deal, you know, to tell a brag about their gift here, their gift there. And, and they had no unity whatsoever. So what I'm talking about tonight is not a new concept. It's not a new struggle in the church. That's why Paul's writing about it in Ephesians chapter 4. It will be the greatest endeavor, endeavor, exertion, effort. It will be one of the hardest things this church or anybody, any other church does is to keep unity among ourselves. I ain't talking about fighting the world, fighting the flesh, fighting the devil. We're going to have a hard enough time to keep from fighting each other. <laughs> the devil's going to see to it because he knows this is what's important. The church of Jesus Christ that he died for is what's going to get the gospel out. It's what's going to help Christians live their life for Jesus Christ. It's what's going to help feed the sheep and help them walk with God. And so he wants to destroy it. And y'all, there has been more churches torn up by simple division than, than the liquor stores, than, than, the, than the triple X stores, than Biden or Kamala or anything like that. More churches have been torn up simply by just straight up division in the church. So tonight you say, why are you preaching this? Do we have division? No, I don't think we do. Do we? I don't, I don't think so. Normally the pastor is the last to know about these things. So if, if we've got division, I don't know about it. So you say, why do you preach it? This is called preventative maintenance. Brother Cliff, my truck's got 120-some thousand miles on it. It purrs like a kitten, especially since I got the, the uh, what was that I got fixed the other day, Brother John? What's that called? Exhaust manifold. Yeah, don't tick no more. Purrs like a kitten. Runs great. But every four or 5,000 miles, I still get the oil changes on it. You know why? It's not knocking. It's not messed up. Yep. I get the oil change because if I don't, it's going to get tore up. Yeah. Exactly right. I still rotate the tires even though it rides smooth. Why? If I don't, the tires will get flat spotted. Yep. So why do we preach things like this? Not because we have division. It's so we don't get division. It's so we head things off at the past so the devil, we're not ignorant of his devices. So when something does come up, we say, uh-huh, oh, I heard a message on that. 
No, not today, Satan. I done heard a message on that. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't falling for that. So there's preventative maintenance preaching. That's what this is tonight, just to help us all to remember unity is important, and it will be the church's greatest endeavor. So let me say three things about unity that I believe will be a help and blessing to us, and we'll hurry and be done. Number one, we see unity personified. Unity personified. Now watch this example that is set forth before us uh, in, in, in a way that we can see it and in a way we all understand it. Uh, I read to you all three verses in the Bible of unity. There's one in Psalm 133. There's two in Ephesians chapter 4. And do you know something about all three of these passages? Each one of them is associated with a member of the Godhead. Psalm 133 deals with Jehovah God the Father. If Read the text. If he, uh, uh, Psalm 133 verse 3 talks about the Lord, the capital L-O-D, Jehovah, commanding the blessing. Over in uh, Psalm 133, that's a picture of the Father. Then look what it said in Ephesians 4.3. Ephesians 4.3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the what? There's the spirit in the bond of peace. And here's the third time unity is mentioned. Look at verse 13 and look who it's associated with. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the who? The Son of God. The unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God. So here we have one is a picture of God the Father. One's a picture of the Holy Ghost. And one's a picture of the Son. So we find all three references, only three references. Unity is personified in the Godhead itself. You say, what do you mean it's personified in the Godhead? Well, you realize the Godhead, they're all separate, but they're all one. The Father's the Father. The Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. The Son is the Son. They are all separate. They all have separate offices. They all accomplish separate tasks, but yet the three is all one. They all have the same mind, they all have the same will, and they all have the same purpose. So too, this is the picture of unity personified. We have many different members in the church. We have many different people in the church. Many different backgrounds in the church. We have many different offices in the church. Many different gifts in the church. But we are not divided. We are still one in mind, one in goal, one in purpose, one in faith, one in purity, one one in doctrine. That's what he look, that's what he said right here. Look at our text. Back to Ephesians 4. Watch what he said in verse 4. Ephesians 4 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So so we see the church is supposed to be like the Lord. Many different offices, one mind. One goal, doing the same thing. And watch how, watch, watch how, this is amazing to me, watch this. Watch how even the Lord himself keeps unity and demonstrates it to us, even among the Godhead. Go with me to Philippians. Hold your place, we're coming back right here. But go to Philippians with me and chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm talking about unity personified. It's personified and we see it in the Godhead. Look at, look at Philippians chapter 2 and, and verse number um, 1, Philippians 2, 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. This is some unity stuff, even though he don't use the word unity. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let me pause right here and say this. You know how to keep unity in the church? Here's how to keep unity in the church. Don't think you're somebody. Most of the time, division comes because somebody thinks they're somebody, and that's where division comes. Here's how to keep unity. Esteem everybody else better than yourself. <laughs> you know, I, I told the fellows in the institute room, but everybody today, Brother Carl, all these churches got signs that say this. Come to our church, the church where everybody is somebody. 
If we ever get a sign like that, this is the word ours is going to say. Ours is going to say, come to our church where everybody is nobody. <laughs> come to our church, everybody's nobody. That's the mindset of, of churches nowadays. You're special. You're a winner. You're important. You're somebody. And then when something happens they don't like, no wonder they get mad. I'm somebody. I'm special. I'm important. I'm so no, no, no. We're nothing. He's everything. We're nothing. This is everything. And we're about more about this than our feelings. We're more about this than what we want. But watch, watch, how, watch how this is demonstrated in the Godhead. Keep reading, keep reading. Verse 5, verse 5, watch this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the way the church is supposed to think. It is personified in Jesus Christ. Watch it, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. It was not robbery for him to be equal with God. He is God. Right? We believe that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is God. He's in the form of God. It's not robbery to be equal with God. But watch what He does. For unity's sake in the will of the Father in the Godhead itself. Verse 7. But made Himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he, I, I don't always understand all this stuff, but I preach it to you, but this is wild stuff. God humbled himself. Somebody explain that to me if you get time. And God became obedient. You ever read over there in Hebrews where it said, talking about Jesus Christ, he learned, learned. God learned some? He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, it's always been said, has it ever occurred to you? Nothing ever occurred to God? But yet, obviously, he learned something. I don't understand that. I know he's all God, he's all man, but there's some wild stuff in there. But for unity's sake... In the Godhead, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know where that was. You say, where did this happen at? In the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, knowing what's coming, and he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. I'm esteeming others better than myself. Not my will. Thine be done. It's a picture for you and I. How do we keep unity in the body of Christ? You do like Jesus did. Humble yourself. Make yourself of no reputation. And esteem somebody else more than you. Amen. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, God does. God likes it. Because look what God does when you do that. Verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. The way up is not up. The way up is down. And giving him a name which is above every name. You say, well, that's just talking about Jesus. I realize this is talking about Jesus. But look what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 20. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20, dealing with this subject of unity amongst the brethren. Matthew chapter 20. While you're turning to Matthew 20, let me say what's happening here in Matthew 20. James and John, uh, their mother comes to Jesus and wants Jesus to grant James and John a place to sit on his right hand and on his left in his coming kingdom in the millennial reign. That's what she asked for. Lord, I want my boys to sit on your right hand and on your left when you sit down to rule as king of kings and lord of lords. And all the other disciples got mad. They're all jealous because these two guys want to be at the top of the line. And watch what Jesus says to try and quench this division that's going on. This is going to disrupt the unity of the 12 apostles. So Jesus is going to try and cut it off at the pass. Watch what he says in verse number 25. Matthew 20, 25. 
But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as, here it is, unity personified, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The example set forth is this. If you want to be something in God's economy, become nothing. We live in... I, uh, the longer I go in ministry, the more sickened I am by the ministers. The longer I go in ministry, the more I am seeing so much self-promotion, self-propagation... It's all about my ministry and my this. Look at me, and I've done this. And, I, and I'll be honest with you. Can I, can I just be honest with you? Early in, in, in some of my ministry, I, 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 I've seen how it's easy to get sucked up into that. I'm preaching here, and I'm preaching for them, and I'm preaching there. And I, just be, I, I can see how a person can let ego take over and it not be about the gospel and the Bible anymore, that it becomes about flesh. And that ain't just in pulpits. That's in pews, too. But I, 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 my, my arena is in the pulpit a lot, so I'm just speaking from that perspective. And I'm going to just be honest with y'all. The longer and the older that I get, Brother John, this is where, this is where I, I'm, I'm so done with social media because that's so much about what it's about. It's about an advancement. It's about getting a leg up, especially in ministry, especially in ministry. This is where I, the only thing I almost hardly post anymore a lot uh, is stuff we got from the church. And so... I'm almost to the place I'm just done with it, and I'm almost to the place, too, where I'm like, I don't even, I don't even want to go preach at these guys' churches no more. Not that I don't want to help them. It's not that I don't love them. It's not that. But I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not looking to make a name for myself. You know what I'd rather go do? I'd rather preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night here, and then go preach at a rescue mission like I did last night down in Augusta. I would. I, 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 get, I get more joy out of that. I'd rather go preach to those 60 guys that can't do nothing for me. And I didn't get a love offering for it. He tried to give me one. I don't want it. I'd rather go preach for that. I enjoyed it more. I felt more fulfillment. I had a better time. I, I, I'm at the place. That, that's what I want to do. Why? Because I find that's where more power's at. That's where more about what God's in the business of is at. But that goes against where we're at today. Where we're at today is you want to be something, then exalt yourself, lift yourself up. But I found out God can do all that if you just go, just, just go be obscure. Yeah. And watch what God does. Anyways, we see unity personified. That's unity personified. It's personified in the Godhead. We just saw it in several different passages. Can we move on very quickly? We not only see unity personified, back to Ephesians chapter 4, back to our text, we see unity perverted. Unity perverted. Now, I want everybody to understand something. Unity has been, listen, while you go back to Ephesians 4, the word unity, especially among our churches, unity has been perverted as some effeminate, passive idea that is accepting of anything and everything for the sake of unity. Let me say an emphatic, no! No! Unity is not some limp-wristed, passive, we just accept anything and everything. No! That's unity perverted. Unity has guidelines. Go figure. Yeah, I'll give you a quote. I got it written down in my Bible. It's one of the greatest quotes I ever heard on this subject. One of the greatest quotes I ever heard on this subject, Brother Donald, come from an old Southern Baptist preacher who's dead and gone to heaven now named Adrian Rogers. How many of y'all ever heard of Adrian Rogers before? He was one of the last great Southern Baptist preachers on a big scale. I mean, like, there's a bunch of still good ones on a small scale, but I mean, like, a big church. He pastored Belmont Baptist Church, R.G. Lee's old church, payday someday. That's the church he pastored out there in Memphis, I think it was, huge church. Preached the King James Bible till the day he died, and was one of the greatest pulpiteers that ever lived. Y'all want to hear somebody that can outline? Some of you preachers want to hear somebody that can 
can outline? Listen to Adrian Rogers. That dude could outline a passage like nobody's business. He was bad at the bone. Anyways, this was his quote. This is what he said. He said, I would rather be divided over truth than united under error. Now, there's a certain kind of division that ain't wrong. He said, I'd rather be divided over truth than united under error. See, that's where we've got to in our churches today. Well, we're just, we, we just united over it. No, 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 no. We ain't just uniting under anything. We are uniting under truth. And if it ain't the truth, then it's a perverted uniting. Amen. There, there's a per- perversion of unity. You know what Ephesians chapter 4 is? It is the unity chapter of your Bible. You say, why do you say it's the unity chapter of the Bible? Because unity is only mentioned three times in your Bible, and two of those times is in this one chapter. And when you read the chapter, this is what you'll find. The first 12 verses, Paul is trying to get them united doctrinally. But The last, uh, ever how many verses it is, from verse 13 down to verse 32, it's not, we don't see a perversion in doctrine. We see that people are getting perverted in their deportment. In other words, because they don't believe nothing, now they don't behave no way either. See, listen to me. What you believe will determine how you behave. And if you ain't behaving right as a Christian, it's because you don't believe right as a Christian. You can say all you want to. I believe in the second coming, and I believe in King James Bible, and I believe this, and I believe that. But if it ain't changed the way you behave, you don't really believe. Amen. Belief affects behavior. Yes, sir. Yeah. Here, here in the unity chapter, watch, watch, we find unity is perverted if we're not united in doctrine. In doctrine. Look at verses... Um, look, at, look, at, look at what he said here. Verses uh, uh, 14. Well, let's start in verse 13. Verse 13, he said, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Watch this doctrinal perversion. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Slide of men. Isn't it interesting? It's not by accident that he said it is children that is deceived by slight of men. Y'all know what slight is? Uncle George, Miss uh, Deb's daddy, does magic. Y'all remember some of y'all seen y'all, some of y'all seen him in other places, but here not long ago we had him for the kids over here. And all of his magic tricks, you know what all of his magic tricks are based on? Slide of hand. You know, get you looking over here, but doing something over here. Something real quick and shifty. And you know who really falls for that kind of stuff? Kids. Like, there was a lot of them magic tricks. Now, some of them I didn't catch either. Some of them I was like, how did he do that? But there was a lot of them. The kids were sitting there like, ah. Oh, and I'm sitting there saying, well, I know how he done that. I mean, you could see it. But children are easily deceived by sleight of hand. Do you know who's easily deceived by the false teachers and the false preachers on on the internet nowadays and all over the place nowadays. You know who's easily deceived by that? People who are babes in Christ and ain't never grown up. Yeah, youngins, children in Christ that they ain't never grown up enough to become men enough or women enough to say, that jack, that jack leg's crazy. Unity perverted. He said we should be united in our doctrine. Don't get perverted in your doctrine. Look what he said. He said they, they, they lie in wait to deceive, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Can I just say this about unity being perverted? We are not about just to fling our arms open at Bible Missionary Baptist Church and embrace every damnable doctrine that floats across our doorstep. I'm sorry, but we're not. We're not allowed it in our assembly. Uh, in, in the last five years since I've been here, we've had several folk that's come in, and you want to know one of the main things that has filtered out uh, several different people that's come in and sat for a little while? They started hearing me preach against charismatics. 
They started hearing me teach, teach the biblical perspective on tongues, the biblical perspective on healing, the biblical perspective on women not being preachers, the biblical perspective on how the church should be run. And brother, they was like, peace out. We ain't staying around there. You want to know why so many Baptist churches are taking Baptists off their sign, getting rid of Baptists? Here's why they're doing it. So they can be all inclusive so that they have no doctrinal standard whatsoever. They don't believe nothing. They, they, don't, they don't believe nothing, and they don't teach nothing. Here's all they preach. They preach coping, caring, sharing, hoping, helping. They don't preach doctrine. Don't preach doctrine because doctrine divides. Yes, but if doctrine divides, it's just going to have to divide. We're not being united under some lie. And Paul said here, it's in the text of unity. He said if we're really going to have unity, we've got to all believe the same thing. Now, I understand. When I say believe the same thing, I understand. We all have little differences in things here and things there in opinions. That's fine. I got no problem with that. But when it comes down to the straight-up Bible text about things, we're not arguing over infant baptism. We ain't baptizing babies. We're not arguing over the mass. We're not arguing over the mass and whether a wafer and, and a little piece of grape juice literally turns into the blood and the body of Jesus. We're not arguing over that stuff. We're not arguing over where we should, we should talk in tongues in our assembly. We're not arguing over the fact that whether some of you women are going to get called to preach. We're not arguing over the fact, you know, some of this garbage about sprinkling. And, uh, we're not arguing over this. We'll receive the weaker brethren, but not to doubtful disputations. We know what we know, we know why we know it, we know why we believe it, and we're going to be unified under it. We're not just believing anything and everything. That's not unity. Amen. Unity that just accepts anything and everything is not real unity tonight. We're, we're, not, we're not joining up with, you know, promise keepers and all this stuff where I'm holding hands with some, you know, dress-wearing priest on this side and holding hands with, you know, some Navajo Indian that believes, you know, in the great spirit God and, oh, on this side. You know, we ain't, hold, we ain't holding hands with everything and saying, well, we're just all going to wherever we're going together. No, we ain't neither. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And that man said, I'm the way, I'm the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is one Lord. There is one God. There is one faith. There is one baptism. Let me throw in a sidebar. There's still just one book. Amen. We're, we're, I'm talking about the right kind of unity. We're talking about unity is getting perverted in our day. And then let me say this. Not only do we see unity in our doctrine, but there's, there should be unity in our deportment. Unity in how we act. Look what he said, verse 16. Verse 16. I'm running hard as I can to the finish. This thing's turned into a piece of fat. The more I chew it, the bigger it's getting. Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. That's, that's a body that's unified. Fitly joined and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making, uh, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now watch, right after he just got done telling us about unity in verse 16, he didn't say unity, but that's what it is. The body is together. Watch then what he says in verse 17. He reminds them about their deportment, the way they live. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, so on and so forth. He gets to verse 22, and he tells them to put off the old man concerning the former conversation and the deceitful lust. Uh, he tells them in verse number 25 to put away lying, speak truth. He tells them in verse number 27, don't give pleasure to the devil. He tells him in verse 29, don't let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He tells him in verse 31, to let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He tells him in chapter 5, verse 3, not to be fornicating and not to be living unclean or covetous lives because these things should not be named among the saints. Do you see what I'm getting at here? There can be no real, listen to this, there can be no real biblical, biblical, if we're interested in Bible unity, there can be no real biblical unity living like the world. Look, look, don't, 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 don't come at, don't come at me, y'all, with this, this thing. Well, but preacher, you know, we all sin and we all fail. Sure we do. Duh. Who don't know that? Who don't know that? But there's a difference 
in stumbling, falling into sin and getting right and continually, habitually, lasciviously living in it and basically shaking your fist in the face of God, the preacher and the church and saying, I don't care what y'all say, I'm going to keep living like this. There ain't no unity with stuff like that. I'm going to show you that here in just a minute with the picture we're going to get to. We're going to get to the picture in just a minute. There ain't no unity with stuff like that. For us to have unity, we will not be accepting of just any lascivious lifestyle that comes, comes through. Y'all, y'all, if you think for a second, look, I, I have no problem. I, I have no problem with two people that are living a homosexual lifestyle coming to this church and sitting down on the pew and listening to me preach. I want to preach to them. They need Jesus. I'll never forget, Miss Vicky told me one time that she witnessed to a man dressed like a woman in a nail place one time and invited him to church. And, 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 and the person broke down crying and said, you would invite me to your church? And she said, yeah, we want everybody to come to church. And she came to me that Sunday and said, I hope I didn't make a mistake by inviting them. I said, sis, you didn't make a mistake. Red, yellow, black, or white, or whatever they are, we want them to come to hear the gospel. But mark this down. There'll never be an individual like that that we'll open the doors to for church membership, for church leadership, to sing on our platform in our choir, or teach our children. That's not unity. A child of God is supposed to walk a different way than the world. And for us to have New Testament Bible unity. See, I'm, see this is where unity's been so perverted. When I'm preaching like this, immediately people are like, well, he don't believe in unity. No, I believe in unity. I believe in Bible unity. There is a difference. Isn't this amazing to me too? I thought about this. What a subject, Brother Mike, for this guy to be preaching. This guy. The unity chapter is being written down and preached by a guy named... Paul. Modern day church would look at him and say, you are no authority to preach on this subject because you are one of the meanest people we've ever met. Yeah. You say, how do you figure that? Because this is the same guy. This is the same guy that when Peter got to teaching bad doctrine in Galatians chapter two, it said, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He ripped Peter up one side and down the other In front of everybody. Over what? Bad doctrine. No unity on bad doctrine. You can't preach on unity. You you were saying ugly things to the brethren about what they believe. Yeah, Yeah, well, what he believed didn't line up with the Bible, so he ripped him. Then this is the same guy, this is the same guy that kicked somebody out of the church because they were fornicating in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and didn't just kick them out of the church, said, turn them over to Satan. For the destruction of the flesh. You know what that is? He didn't just correct somebody about bad doctrine. He corrected somebody about bad deportment. You can't preach on unity. You've been so ugly, you run that poor fornicator off from the church. Yeah, and you know what happened because he ran him off? He repented and got right and come back to the church. Isn't that something? That the guy who's going to preach about unity is so foreign to what perverted unity is today. He's got... That what I just said to you about the way Paul handled things, that is balanced, bold, biblical unity. Bible unity. All right. So we see not only uh, unity personified, unity perverted, but lastly we see unity pictured. And that's Psalm 133. Let's go back to where we started at and look at these wonderful pictures of unity. Man, this is great pictures of unity. Uh, Psalm 133 And verse number one, this is where we'll wind her up at right here. Unity pictured. Look at these wonderful pictures of unity. You say, what is the picture of unity? Well, we see unity is pictured in the fact that it is precious. Unity is precious. It is so very precious for us to keep unity at the church. Watch what it said, verse one. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. You want to know something about this oil? I don't, I, my time has faded. I, I don't have time to do it. I'd keep you here all the way to 845 and I just ain't going to do it. But I want you to write this reference down. I want you to write these down and go home and look at it. Look at Exodus chapter 30 
verses 22 to 32. You know what you find in Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 through 32? Exodus 30, verses 22 to 32. What you find there is, that's where the ointment, this oil, that's a picture of, of unity, that's where it was made. And you want to know something that was said about that oil? That said, it, this is what God told him in verse 32 of Exodus 30. He said, I don't want you making nothing like that for any other use than for here at the house of God. He said, I want it to be special. It's precious. There's none like it nowhere else. Ain't none like it anywhere. You can't find it nowhere else. And you want to know something? There ain't nothing. Now, that ain't, good. that ain't good English, but that's good theology. There ain't nothing like a group of God's people in unity at the church. You can't find it anywhere else. You, know, you want to know something? That's why when people who are saved leave Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches, you know what they'll do? If they don't yoke up with a church, they'll yoke up with some club or yoke up with some organization or some group and yoke up with, you know why they do that? They're looking for that same acceptance and that same unity that they left at the local church because the Holy Ghost on the inside still craves that fellowship. So they're looking for that somewhere else, but you can't find it nowhere else. It ain't the same nowhere else. There is something special about God's people in one heart, one mind, and one accord that we love each other and we pray for each other and it ain't dog eat dog and we're not out to get each other but we're out to love each other and help each other walk with God. There is something special. Brother, you can almost smell it. I think, Brother, I thank God we have visitors coming here from time to time. They'll say, man, there's something special going on in here. It's unity. It's a bunch of people who want to live for God, want to walk with God, want to do right. And you can't manufacture that nowhere else tonight. It's, it's special. It's precious. You want to know something about this unity? I, I would encourage you to do a study on that, that anointing oil of Aaron and his sons. You can read about it in Exodus. You can read about it in Leviticus. You, I don't have time to take you to these passages that I was planning on taking you to. But you know what God told Aaron over there? God told Aaron this. He said, because you got this oil on you, picture of unity, you are not to break it. Don't miss this. You're not to break it even for your family. Read Leviticus 10. You know what happened in Leviticus 10? Nadab and Abihu, his sons, got scorched with fire because they offered strange fire. And God told Aaron, Aaron, I'm not even going to let you attend the funeral, son. Yeah. He said, why? Because you got the oil on you, and you're not even allowed to go. He told him over there in Leviticus chapter number 21, he said, if your daughter turns out to be a harlot, you're not to break the oil for her or for nobody else. What's that a picture of, preacher? That's a picture of this. You're to side up with the truth even over your family. I know people that'll break unity in the church's life and their own life for the sake of yoking up with somebody that ain't living right. Yes, sir. Just because it's their friend or their family. Yes, sir. That ain't Bible. Amen. Brother, you want to see God bless you? Choose the truth and choose God over your friends and your family every time. Amen. If your friends and your family's in the right, stand with them. But if they ain't in the right, you keep standing with the church to the exclusion of your friends and family. Amen. Amen. We see unity is precious. Let me say this. Unity is permeating. Unity is permeating. Look at the pictures here. Look at it. It's permeating. Watch verse 2. Watch verse 2. It said it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And watch it. That went down to the skirts of his garments. It permeated him all over. Everybody could smell it. Can I say this? Not only can you smell unity, it permeates a place. It gets in a place and it permeates a place. You can smell division too. Boy, I'll never forget. I got an illustration for this, Brother Keith. I'll never forget me and Harold, Brother Harold Cooper, God bless his soul, gone to heaven now, and Brother Jason Fuller and uh, Mike Martin, That's it, the four of us. We all struck out one day years ago, 12 years ago. 
something like that. And we went up, I'll not even say the town for sake of people maybe watching, but we went up to a town in Tennessee to a camp meeting they's having up there. And we knew when we went up there, Brother Josh, that they, the church was having problems. The old pastor was still there, and the new pastor was there, and son, there was two factions we had heard, but we were just going up there to have camp meeting. And it was supposed to go from Monday to Friday. And Brother J.C., we got up there, and I'll never forget, so help me God, I was the first preacher up on Monday night. I preached the first message. <laughs> Maybe that's why the whole thing split right down the middle. Praise <laughs> But no, I stayed away from it. I didn't touch it. I was still just a young preacher, and I wasn't saying nothing. It was over there, and I was running as far this way as I could. I just tried to preach Jesus and God's good, and I wasn't even touching it. But anyways, I will never forget, Brother Dwayne, when we walked in that church. I'd never been there in my life. We walked in the back door, and immediately it was like phew, something hit you. It was two sections of pews. It didn't have three sections. It was two sections. And I, my hand to God, Brother Chad, I lie not. This is what it looked like. It was about as deep as these two sections right here. I, hand to God, I lie not. There were people sitting from here and there about to right here. And then nobody was sitting from here to about back here. And then there was more people sitting from here to the back. Like the middle sections were empty. You say, what was that about? It was two factions. <laughs> like all you people in the middle, there wasn't nobody in the middle. It was just people on one side and people on the other side. And I don't remember which side was for who or not. It don't really matter. But brother, I mean, you could cut the tension with a knife. And I was like, Lord, what have we walked into? And, and Tuesday night, <laughs> we went Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, and Tuesday night, son, the thing blew all to pieces. <laughs> Brother Dan, somebody stood up over here and said, well, I'm going to tell y'all something I don't like, blah, 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 right in the middle of camp meeting. And somebody over here said, well, I'm going to tell you something I don't like, I don't like. And son, they went to fighting. And I'll never forget, Jason Fuller looked at me, and he, he looked down the pew, and he looked at us, he said, y'all put your pistols in your front pockets. <laughs> he thought we might have to shoot our way out. <laughs> so I did. Mike Martin was the only one without a gun, and he said, I'm the only Mexican here. They're going to kill me. <laughs> I said, Mike, stay with me, baby. I won't let them have you, praise God. <laughs> I'm serious. And that, you know what happened? That meeting blowed up that night. The pastor and the former pastor said, we need to have a conference. They went downstairs. They come back up. It was supposed to go through Friday. And they said, y'all, we regret to inform you. We're closing the meeting down right now. And everybody went back home. It shut it down on Tuesday night. I'm just saying division can permeate just like unity can. You want to know what can permeate? One bad attitude in a service can quench and permeate an entire service. J just like a good spirit, just like a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Now I'm telling you, I, it is the truth. I have literally, I have literally, I have, I have literally... Went home after some services on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights, and it was tight. And my wife would say, man, it was tight in there tonight. What was going on? I said, yeah, it was tight. You don't know why it was tight? And she said, no, I don't know why it's tight. And I said, there was one individual in there, had an attitude the whole service. Would not receive the preaching, come in with a bad attitude, sat down with a bad attitude, and left with a bad attitude. And, they, and, and it could have been anything. Who knows what it was? Maybe they was arguing with their husband or with their wife or with their children or maybe they mad. Who knows what they But that one quenching spirit hindered everything. That's why it's so precious. That's why it's, it's, so, it's so permeating. Make sure your heart's right when the church comes together so that you're not hindering anybody else from getting something from God. It's something about it, the permeating of this. Did you see what it said? It went from his beard, his beard, that's his mouth. He had unity on his mouth. He wasn't going to say nothing that was going to cause the oil to be broken. Unity on his mouth. And then it went all the way down to his feet. What's that? It, it directed where he went. He kept the unity even in the place where he went. He was going to make sure he stayed in unity with the Lord and with God's people. I'm done. We see not only is it precious, unity is pictured as precious, permeating, and it's pictured as powerful. Watch verse 3, and we're done. Psalm 133.3. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, 
For there, watch how powerful it is. I didn't get to talk about the permeating of the dew and all. That's a whole another sidebar that I would take 10 more minutes to preach on. I ain't got time. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Do you see what it says about unity? That's what the whole chapter, Psalm 133, is about. God commands a blessing in life upon this kind of congregation. The people who, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So at the end, it says God commands a blessing and commands life on a group that's in Bible unity. Now, I'm going to tell you what I want for Bible Missionary Baptist Church, and I believe we have it in spades at this point in our church history. We have God's blessing, and we have God's life. Our church is alive, and our church is being blessed. You can't deny that. God's been so good to us. God's been so good to us that, Brother Kent, sometimes I walk around like, where the devil at? <laughs> Y'all ever feel like that? I mean, seriously, God's been so good to us. I mean, the devil ain't gonna just going to let it leave us alone, Brother Xander. It's like, where's the devil? He's coming somewhere. God's blessed and God's given life. And I don't want to do anything myself to hinder none of that. It's too good. It's too precious. It's too powerful. It's too wonderful. People realize it. People recognize it. People respond to it. Sinners get saved. And you say, what's it going to take? It's going to take where we started at tonight. Endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. It will be an extreme exertion. <laughs> You're going to have to try. I'm going to have to try. Say, preacher, we just uni- going to be unified over anything and everything and let anything go? No, 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 no. We're going to follow the Bible. But if we all will follow the Bible and walk with God, we can all stay in unity together. In unity with the Lord. Let's all stand tonight. Esther, come help me over here. Just play something softly and we're going to be done. Father, I pray that you would... Um, Lord, no doubt, no doubt, all of us together, would, myself included, the congregation, we would all say amen, and that's right. Everything that was preached tonight, that's Bible, that's true, and we believe it. But God, help us not to be forgetful hearers. Because there's coming a day and coming an hour, there's coming a moment where the temptation will be so heavy to, to try and destroy what we said amen to. Help us not to do it. Help us, God, to make our mind up that we're going to endeavor to keep unity in the church. Bible unity, balanced unity, bold unity, the right kind, speaking the truth in love kind. Father, thank you for you people that's gathered here tonight to listen to this Bible message. I pray that you'd give us all a heart and a desire right now that we would all commit in ourselves, Lord. Don't let, God, the Bible said it it must needs be that offenses come, but woe be the man by whom they come. God, I pray tonight that we'd all say, Lord, I don't want to be the one that causes an offense. I don't want to be the one that breaks the sanctity of the oil that you put on this place. Help me to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Put a, set a watch before the doors of my lips, oh God. Keep our hearts in tune. Keep our lives in tune and in check. Walking with God. We'll thank you for it. Help our church. You've blessed it. And we give you the thanks for it. You've been so good. God, tonight I pray we would all commit to keep the unity. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to come tonight, you come. She's going to sing a verse or two and we'll be done.